Here is a woman. What does she dream of? When does she feel proud? How many times will she leave her mark? How many ways will she light up the world? She's got this wonderful, infectious laugh uh, that uh, it carries quite far. And sometimes it'll be surprising because you'll be in the middle of something and she'll go, ha! <laughs> and there's a joy and a, and a mirth that I think sometimes the public doesn't always see. I just remember her holding my hand a lot. I remember that a lot. And, and like, I felt like she tried to soothe me. It wasn't about um, pictures or a big production. She just kind of showed up. And she had a, a very simple message, thank you, and I'll do whatever I, I can for you. And uh, she, she would make good on that promise. I love to watch her with people, and I can see the, the effect of her kindness and that it's real. Hillary Rodham grew up in Park Ridge, Illinois. Her father was a Navy man. My father was a chief petty officer uh, at home as well as in the Navy, and he really had the attitude that, you know, don't whine, don't complain, do what you're supposed to do. Do it to the best of your ability. Her mother, Dorothy, was terribly neglected. She was on her own, working as a housekeeper by the time she was 13. She once said that job was the first time she saw what a loving family looked like. She told me one time her young parent left her overnight by herself. She was like four years old, three or four years old. And they gave her a uh, a uh, set of coupons so she could go to the corner cafe and get food. And I mean, just the image of this little girl all by herself walking down the stairs of the walk-up tenement, out the door alone, to the corner, to the cafe, and getting food with coupons just haunts me. Here is a woman making her first marks on the world. She is, we all know, bright and promising, an achiever. And yet, extraordinarily, what is most striking about the young woman is her heart. Her commitment to making people's lives better, her abiding belief that the same opportunities that Chelsea has had should be extended to every child. That comes through in everything that she does. She could have joined a big law firm, been a corporate bigwig. Instead, she chose the Children's Defense Fund. There, she went door to door, gathering stories to help children with disabilities who were denied schooling. She challenged a system that kept teen boys in the same jails as grown men. She went undercover as a housewife to prove that Alabama was defying the law to keep its schools all white. She was successful at all three. I remember watching her in class, and I just thought she was fascinating. And I followed her out of the class, and I got as close as I am to you, and I lost my guts and didn't speak to her. I said to the person I was with, who is that? And she said, well, that's Bill Clinton. He's from Arkansas. That's all he ever talks about. And literally at that moment, I heard him say, and not only that, we grow the biggest watermelons in the world. So that, that's all I knew about him. Here is a woman entering life as the wife of a politician. She is, to say the least, an untraditional first lady. In Arkansas, she boldly reforms the state's educational system. And in the White House, she eagerly takes on national health care. For old school Washington, health care reform is not welcome. My mother wanted me to be resilient and she wanted me to be brave. I was like four. And there were lots of kids in the neighborhood and I would come out and I would have like a bow in my hair and the kids would all pick on me. It was my first experience of being bullied and I was terrified. And one day I'm running into the house and my mother met me and she said to me, there's no room for cowards in this house. You go back outside and figure out how you're going to deal with what these kids are doing. Hillary works with both Democrats and Republicans, and together they create a plan that to this day provides medical insurance for 8 million American children. 
8 million children. It is a violation of human rights when babies are denied food or drowned or suffocated or their spines broken simply because they are born girls. Now, you and I weren't there, but it has been said that the UN Fourth Women's Conference in Beijing was where Hillary woke up the world. Human rights are women's rights, and women's rights are human rights once and for all. When she said women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights in 1995, that was a radical statement. She had never held public office before. She'd been a senator for just nine short months. And then our nation bowed its head in grief. It appeared as though a dark blackish gray curtain had just dropped between lower Manhattan and the rest of the city. Injury wise, um, both my legs were shattered. They believe that the landing gear of the second plane hit me because it was so hot that um, it closed my wounds. Around 9 o'clock at night, one of my staff people, one of Chuck's staff people, came in and whispered to both of us that the White House had just sent up its first request for funding, and there was not a penny in it for New York. New York needed a champion. Hillary and Chuck tirelessly worked their way across Washington not stopping until they reached the Oval Office. President Bush looked at me and he said, what do you need? And I said, we need $20 billion. And Chuck Schumer said, we need $20 billion. And he said, you got it. Her mind just quickly grasped, this is a much bigger issue than replacing these buildings. This is replacing the American spirit. I remember just taking a few pictures. And when I got them developed, the flash from this camera against a dark sky reveals all the particles that are in the air. It looks like snow. When our first responders began to get sick and questioned the quality of the air at Ground Zero, Hillary loudly took on the EPA and won them health benefits. People that the air was safe. It wasn't safe. Not only did she say she was going to fight for us, it wasn't idle chatter. At the same time, she very quietly helped some survivors rebuild their lives. I remember talking to Hillary, saying, I'm, I can't, I can't have this wedding unless I can dance. I can dance, I need to be able to dance my wedding for it to happen. And she, and she said, you're, you're gonna do it. I know you are. Hearing her say that helped me believe it. Well, the Bin Laden situation is a perfect example of how valuable Hillary's judgment and the strength uh, it was to me in every decision I made. I've seen the photograph. So have you. We'll never quite know what it felt like to be in that room. But look at her. Look at her face. She's carrying the hope and the rage of an entire nation. When the opportunity arose for me to be part of the small group advising the president about whether or not the intelligence we had was strong enough for him to act, I took that responsibility personally and on behalf of the 3,000 people who were murdered, the tens of thousands of loved ones who were left behind, uh, the horror that was inflicted on our country. Just listening to her talk about what that meant, I think we all felt both the extraordinary responsibilities but also the extraordinary privilege of being able to, to serve the American people. I was sitting in a back room by myself with my feet up and my sneakers were sticking out of my dress. And um, someone came behind me and hugged me and I had no idea who it was. And it was Hillary. Without press, without fanfare, there are only family photos. Hillary quietly attended Debbie's wedding and Debbie danced. She danced. There is more than enough of the American dream to go around. If we are committed to growing it, nurturing it, passing it on to our children and our grandchildren, I can't think of anything more thrilling than being part of that.
We all hope for a better tomorrow. Any parent knows your every dream for the future beats in the heart of your child. Chelsea's heart beats Hillary's dreams, and Hillary's heart beats Dorothy's. It's how we are made. The American dream is passed down from generation to generation to generation. There's lots of other ways we could spend these golden years of our lives. She wants to do this because she believes she can make a difference now, and I do too. I am going to stand up and fight for every American because I think if you are the president, that's exactly what you should do every day. There are show horses, and then there are workhorses. Horses that you count on to deliver, and uh, she's a workhorse. You have to love this country, believe in this country, lift up the people in this country. To have a, a decade after decade of being in the front lines of trying to bring about change. And do everything you can to make sure they believe you're getting up every morning in that big old White House, thinking about them, understanding what they're up against, and working to make it better. She does that because she feels deep in her heart that here in the greatest country on Earth, everybody deserves a shot. I hope to unify our country. I hope to bring people together. I hope to break down every barrier that prevents Americans from joining hands and making our country everything it should be. That's what I hope for my grandchildren, and I know that's what my mother would hope for me. How many times will she leave her mark? How many ways will she light up the world? This is the woman.